pre-lined up for the remainder of the year. But uh, uh, and this is about the Ocean Guard and Storm Filter Storm Treatment Train. Um, certainly our most popular sort of um, combination of devices at Ocean Protect. Uh, and uh, there's no one better to talk about this than uh, uh, Mr. T, uh, Harut. Um, so Harut is a uh, highly experienced practitioner. I think he's got about 15 years in the storm industry, including about 10 at Ocean Protect. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to Harut. But just as a reminder, uh, if you've got any questions you'd like to put forward to Harut, uh, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and we'll certainly do our darndest to try and address those, uh, address those questions. Um, but no look, Harut. Looks like um, I'm not the only one with technical problems. Murray Powers just texted me. Can't join. <laughs> not sure what's going on. Um, Zoom isn't giving me access. So it's all right. one of those days. Conspiracy theory. <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Sorry, everyone. Um, thank you for, for joining in and thank you for your patience. Thanks, Brad, for the intro. Um, we'll go through this pretty quickly. Obviously, um, time's now of the essence. So, um, and Brad, in the meantime, I'm not sure if you can help Murray with his um, connection problems there. But guys, we'll, we'll go over um, the stuff pretty quickly. Um, we'll cover a few few particular things, considerations, applications, obviously details about um, the Ocean Guard components, effectiveness design, maybe configuration, some maintenance details. We'll get through it. If there's questions as we're going along, please um, put them in the chat box and we'll, we'll definitely get to them. Um, you know, timing, um, time, timing um, you know, on our side, hopefully. Um, so a, a few things I want to point out just to start off with. So obviously when it comes to, to you know, designing and, and we're talking about Ocean Guard and Stormfitter here in particular. So designing these devices or any device, to be honest, water quality, targeting um, objectives and, and the like, obviously is always important and that's generally the priority. So we're always trying to hit targets, DCP requirements. Water quality is one aspect of it. Hydraulics obviously is important. We want to make sure these, these products are going to operate and they're going to operate long term. So mass load is the third thing in the equation, making sure these systems operate, the longevity is there long term and designed with maintenance in mind in terms of how long they're going to last, not how do you clean them, but are they going to last long enough? So we're designing in music, for example, often is the case, and we're targeting an annual um, theoretical load reduction. I can make music work with one filter and one basket, for example, or I can make it work with four baskets. Four baskets might be um, obviously relative to your pits. We might have five cartridges rather than one cartridge because your catchment requires that many filters from a mass load perspective. All products, regardless of what technology they are, by retention, for example, they're all limited by mass. Some people might refer to them as hydraulic loading rate. So maintenance is, is very important. Why do we say that and, and how do we know that? Well, we've got a lot of experience. You know, whether it's here in Australia, whether it's overseas, you can see in Australia, you know, over the last close enough to 20 years, 28,000 storm filter cartridges, 20,000 plus ocean guards or previous generation Enviropods um, sold by Stormwater 360. Um, we have a lot of information. We have a lot of experience either through designing, servicing and maintaining, uh, monitoring, R&D program. There's a lot of information that comes along with this. Because of the work that we've done and the wealth of knowledge that we've, we've attained because of the amount of work that we've done here and over in the US, um, this, we think the systems have been designed to the point where they're quite easy to install, manage, they're effective. There's a lot of support that comes with it and the data is all available. We're, we're transparent with everything. Um, products are obviously used in you know, the broad spectrum of types of projects, industrial, commercial, high-rise resi. We're now into your subdivision type projects as well. Some councils are using these products or accepting these products. They know that might be restrictions on maybe a vegetated solution, hence why these products might be used. So let's get into it. So Ocean Guard, um, pretty simple device. Um, you know, developed as, a, I guess, your primary step in the treatment train. Your GPT type approach, except it's at source. Rather than end of line, you're in your pits throughout the catchment. Multiple bag options, um, 1600 mi and 200 micron bag. We generally use the 200 micron bag when it's in conjunction with a storm filter. So in treatment train, using Ocean Guards to pre-treat storm filter, usually using a 200 micron bag. As I said, um, at source, it's not a new technology. So Ocean Guard um, has similar features and performance um, 
to your yeah, off patent technologies and previous generation products like Envoropod. Right, so pretty simple flow diversion and, and skirt around the top, frame assembly um, for the, the certain types of bags. We've got the cage supporting the bag. Um, you can see a few components there in the photo, but pretty simple, effective product. Probably one of the main features that sets this apart from other pit baskets on the market, on the market, the frame, the supporting structure at the top. Not only does it give it um, the, the robust nature, I guess, of the product and the support, it gives you the opportunity to actually detail proper overflow, overflow slots. It's easy to install the system. It's easy to manage the system. Um, you get a large surface area with the filter bag. So for our type two and type three bags, which we'll come to later on in the presentation, but for the medium and deeper bags, we have a cage that supports the bag. The cage doesn't block or, um, or I guess, stop any of that filtration surface area because of the design of the cage. You might have some other products that have a mechanism built into the bag to provide support. That'll limit your filtration surface area. So simple little things, but they, they make a difference to the way that the system works. So just going back, one other optional item might be all socks, for example, which we can retrofit to the systems. So how effective are they? Pictures a thousand words, I, I, um, I like to say, and you can see here with these photos. You may think that you're, you're not gonna generate that much pollutant load, but you probably are in reality. And we're obviously not you know, going out um, you know, as people just living our daily lives, looking you know, in pits all the time and determining how much pollutant load is coming out, but we are as a business. You can see from the baskets that we, um, that we have in our maintenance um, cycle and our maintenance contracts, what we're removing from, from the waterways. So it's not only that it, we're stopping pollution from going into our waterways, we're protecting filters downstream. So products like your filter, the storm filter, your jellyfish, maybe filter, bioretention, whatever it might be. We're also putting a lot of this information back into our R&D program so we can innovate further. So the information is important, but we do collect a lot of material. Um, these products will collect a lot of material. Data to support the products. The data is available. Right? The data might be a bit older for Ocean Guard. Yes, we are testing in the field um, as we are with some other products. And we do have an R&D program that's in operation for multiple products. Um, Performance wise though, the data's there and it's generally widely accepted. Consistent approach, your, your performance you can see on the screen there with particle capture down to about hundred micron over time, but 75% TSS up to that sort of level, 30 TP, 21 TN. That's the sort of effectiveness that you're gonna, you're gonna have with the device derived from testing in the field and the laboratory. Right. With regard to designing it in terms of modeling, um, 20 litres a second per ocean guard is what you'd use for your high flow bypass, proportioning it um, for the number of baskets and pits that you're using it in. Um, so if you car park, for example, you might have five baskets, you're going to put in 100 litres a second with one, one treatment node representing the five baskets. So you can proportion that. The nodes, as you can see, if you might have experienced as well, if you've, if you've dealt with this, which a lot of you have, I know, um, the nodes are available. Happy to provide you with nodes, happy to um, assist you with your music modeling. If you want advice, if you're not sure, if you want to send us details, um, you can talk to people like me, um, colleagues like Dan Page, Peter Worth, Mike Wicks, our, um, our resident vegan, Mr. Brad Dowrymple. You can contact us anytime, we're here to help. If you're not sure, let us know. We're, we're here to help. We have an in-house engineering team as well, whether it's modeling, whether it's flow rates, whether it's arrangements, you can give us a call and we'll help out. Configuration. Multiple sizes available, standard default sizes, anywhere from 450 pits up to 1200s for your standard configurations. Um, the bag depths I mentioned a second ago. So you've got the three options there. The 300 and the 600 bag comes with the cage to support the cage. Why is the cage important? It actually helps keep the shape of the bag um, as well as supporting the bag, which means when you're gonna remove the bag for maintenance, it's still retained that shape that it originally would have had. So it's not hard to remove through an opening, an access opening in a pit. Um, the bag can tend to bulge if you don't actually have the supporting cage for those deeper bags. So it does help with maintenance. To give you a bit of a guide, we do provide an overall depth in the table. So you'll see the matrix there, which is provided with um, our Ocean Guard drawings. The overall depth is important because it gives you the combination depth of the frame and the bag together. So you can see in the schematic on the right, we've got bag depth, we've got overall depth on the left, and we've got clearance. 
Obviously important to have clearance under the Ocean Guard if you can do that. Some council areas you might have to have a particular clearance. Might be equal to the pipe obvert if there's pipe flow through under the bag. However, there are multiple ways to configure the Ocean Guard. So as I mentioned, let us know and we'll help you configure the Ocean Guard in a practical way that is still maintainable and responsible in terms of arrangement. You know, I, I do see it from time to time, unfortunately, and, and it's a matter of obviously trying to make your um, music model work, but Ocean Guards might be put into a music model collecting a part of the catchment where it's just not practical to do so. So you've got to think about where you're locating them and what does it mean if it's in a music model? So don't stick them in a rainwater tank simply because you want to collect roof water through a basket before a rainwater tank or an OSD if you're not thinking about the top water level. You've got to think about what's happening to that basket. Do we put them in into, um, into different sort of arrangements and configurations relative to what you see on the screen? Yes, but we think about it. You've got to think about how is it going to work? Can you maintain it? Is it going to actually function? Is it pointless doing it or not? Storm filter. So probably um, probably one of the most commonly used proprietary filters around the world, um, developed many years ago um, in, in, I guess, response or as a solution to, at the time, problems with your flatbed sand filter type systems. So the idea was to take that flat surface, turn it up vertically into a cylindrical shape, as you can see. So it's a radial filter, large surface area. So we're talking about the entire surface area around that cartridge on the, uh, on the circumference. Um, because of that, we had to have large surface area because we have a controlled filtration rate. We have a restricted disc at the bottom of this cartridge where flow will leave the cartridge. We control the contact time on that media. So controlled flow rate, large surface area, good filtration, um, obviously high removal efficiencies, um, controlled operation and because we have a hood and a float and an air valve we create a siphon we can back flush we now introduce a back flush, flush mechanism so the filter is ready for that next operational cycle so pretty effective pretty simple eight iterations over the last 25 plus years to get to this point the cartridge is pretty much at the point where it's it's pretty damn good it the way it operates the way it functions the back flush um, the flexibility in design they're all, all those boxes are ticked. It's about innovating with media. And so the, the product itself, fantastic when it comes to operation cycles, life cycles and all that sort of thing. Rechargeable cartridge, because it comes apart, we can replace the media. So every aspect of the cartridge has been thought about and has been designed in a way to provide the best outcome. Um, media options, um, we tend to use phosphor sorb or p -sorb these days in most areas. Um, and if we aren't, we're probably on the cusp of getting approvals in those areas where you, where you need approvals. Um, so again, fossil sorb media, very effective. The innovation on from ZPG media, the Zlite perlite activated carbon mix. Fossil sorb has allowed us to increase the capacity of the cartridge to improve performance under a, a greater control of flow rate. We've basically doubled the capacity of the system. So we've actually increased the surface area. So when I mentioned surface area there on the screen, we're not talking now about the surface area of the cartridge. We're talking about the surface area of the filtration media. So the perlite base has now been doubled. So we've, we've removed the zeolite. We've replaced it with perlite that is um, coated with an activated alumina. So better chemical properties for ion exchange, much more media depth for your filtration under a more controlled flow rate, better performance. And Mass load, I mentioned mass load at the start. We know what our mass load is for the cartridges. So again, long-term longevity, we're providing a longer life to the system. One of the other important features that we may not think about at design, but it's important to maintenance contractors is the, is the weight of these cartridges. The piece orb has allowed us to ensure that they remain a lightweight cartridge. In fact, they're a lot lighter than, than the old ZPG cartridges. So a 690 piece orb cartridge, for example, 23 kilograms. What does it set it apart? What, what does, um, what are the things that set it Stormfer apart from maybe other products on the market? And I, I know it's, it's often thought about, there are other products on the market, but what are the differences? Let's talk about Stormfitter in particular, right? So we think about whether it's the way it's arranged. And, and if you're looking at the photos there, you can see it's a pretty clean environment. There's a concrete floor. The cartridges lock into a simple bayonet fitting. There's no exposed pipe work. 
We don't hold water permanently in the chamber below the cartridges. As I mentioned, the cartridges are easy to handle, they're lightweight. So everything about it is simple, effective and safe. It doesn't add to the cost of the maintenance because you've got to pump water out. We don't have the filter surface area sitting against a water volume or, or um, a water um, sump, let's call it. that. The false floor, which we'll come to later on, um, I'll show you the false floor, but the false floor enables us to support the pipe work uh, and to eliminate that standing water. Gives you a safe platform to work from when you're maintaining the systems as well. And so these are some of the differences that set Stormfitter apart from other products on the market that I think are important when you are designing the system. So are we designing responsibly for the asset owner and the cost that they're gonna incur later on down the track when we're all gone and we're talking about maintenance now? So important to think about. Like Ocean Guard, as I mentioned, it's a very effective product. Um, again, you'd be surprised how much material you actually build up in, in a storm filter system. Whether it's fine particul particulates, you know, you can see clay material, sediment, organic material, gross pollutants. We still capture gross pollutants. We capture all of those sorts of materials that you, you have in a system. Closer shot of the cartridge there, new cartridge on the right, used cartridge on the left. It's not only just showing you that we catch pollutants. What's important here is that this highlights that the entire cartridge is being used. So the hood that protects the surface area of the cartridge that allows us to engage the siphon um, also allows us to ensure the entire media bed and depth of the cartridge is operating. If we didn't have the hood and we didn't, didn't engage a siphon, we wouldn't utilize the entire cartridge media um, depth. We'd be draining in through the bottom the entire time um, or as water comes up to whatever level that, that water level is, um, relative to the cartridge, that's the only media depth you'd use. In this case with storm filter, we utilize the entire cartridge because we engage a siphon and that photo shows it. Up to the top, under the hood, um, at the cap, the entire media bed has, um, has been exhausted and, and has been filtering water, uh, filtering water. So even if the water level drops in the system, we have a hanging water column in the filter that allows us to continually use the entire depth. Again, performance, the data is available. Whether it's Australian data, overseas data, it's representative of conditions here. We've worked with our colleagues in the US for long enough. We've done our R&D uh, and testing and monitoring programs here in Australia for long enough that we know what we need to, to look for. We know what we need um, to demonstrate. We wanna make sure it's representative. We're modeling in music, it's representative with, with what you model in terms of concentration pollutant loads. Um, and with whatever you'd classify as the most strict protocols around. Still a bit of work to be done in Australia when it comes to protocols, but the data is available. It's, we're transparent with the information. If you ask us for the information, no problem, it's available. I would argue that there is no other product available that has as much data as Stormfilter. Um, so in our opinion, largest data set, the performance is there. We consistently model with the same numbers. We don't change our music modeling nodes just to give us a better commercial outcome. The nodes are consistent. The only time it'll change if there's a new report that's gonna support a change in the data. I mentioned earlier, R&D program, we're continually testing. So as data becomes available and we're, we're ready for it, we'll be bringing it out to the market. But if you request a model from us or advice on a model, or you want music nodes, the music nodes for Stormfooter won't change like they don't change for Ocean Guard. We have ca calculators that we do provide upon request. If you'd like them, we use them internally in house. May, may be similar to some other companies using some calculators out there and maybe it would have been, um, would have been nice for them to uh, actually provide some credit to the people that developed the, uh, the calculators, maybe one Warren Jones. But anyway, we won't get into that today. We don't have too much time. We model the storm filter cartridge as the generic node. The performance is built into the generic node and the chamber is modeled as the SF chamber upstream of that cartridge, representing the chamber that the filters are in. We adjust the K values in the node for the chamber down to the value of one or zero. We don't want the chamber to add or duplicate the effectiveness of um, the retention time. It's built into the filter effectiveness already. I don't care what any company says to you. If you're modeling a media filter and that's how it's being tested, that's how you should model it. It's simple. Um, that's how it should be done. That's the correct way to do it. In terms of configurations, um, 
probably one of the things I need to clarify um, that's often a bit of a, a confusing thing, I guess, is the name of the cartridge or the cartridge models. There's three models, the 690, the 460 and the 310. However, that doesn't mean that's the size of the actual cartridge. That's referred to as the siphon height, sometimes the, the hydraulic drop for the system. So a 690 cartridge, for example, requires 690 millimetres of water absolute minimum from the top of the false floor um, to engage the siphon. Physically, a 690 cartridge, for example, as you can see, 840 high. So on our drawings these days, we have this table that provides the physical height. So you can think about the available depth in the tank. Can you fit them in? Are you going to be able to maintain them? How many access points will you need based on the number of cartridges you're using? The cartridge name remains consistent, obviously. We provide a standard weir height, which would account for a false floor. As you can see on the pictures there, we, re we reference the false floor above the pit base. So that's typically detailed at 150 for these weir heights. That can be reduced depending on the number of cartridges and the under drain pipe work we're going to supply and de design. That false floor thickness can come down. We can bring it down to 50 mil, subject to how many cartridges you have. Um, but the height from the top of the false floor generally re remains consistent. But the details are all there. The flow rates are there. The flow rates are in the music nodes as well. They're on the drawings. If you request the drawings from us, we can always provide those to you as well. Um, in terms of practical um, photos and, and actually seeing what they look like as a manhole, as a precast manhole, options that we supply for precast, you can see the round tanks. We can fit up to 25 cartridges. We have multiple sizes of these round manholes. Um, we have rectangular vaults, precast vaults. We can manufacture special, special tanks. Um, we just did one recently for Central Station. So we can manufacture special tanks to fit an application if that doesn't fit our standard range of products. Um, multiple vaults that come together, as you can see, are manifolded together in some of these photos. Previous photo, you saw manholes. Detention systems are quite popular, obviously. So if you've got a detention requirement on site below ground OSD, it's pretty common these days for us to create a chamber within the OSD to house the filter cartridges. We supply and install our under drain pipe work and our concrete false floor, um, depending on the, on the application. We can possibly even help out with uh, an aluminium wheel. You can see in, in some of these photos, offline arrangements, which I'll come to in a sec as well. You can see a photo there of a detention system with a dissipation um, chamber, bottom left corner there. Um, but in terms of um, the configuration, I mentioned earlier some of the differences. You can see the pipework in a closer shot there. Um, we encase that in concrete. If we left that open, number one, you're going to hold water below the cartridge to the base of that tank, so that pipework sitting in water. And number two, you're not going to have a very safe environment. You're going to have to remove that that water volume. Um, and from, in my opinion, it's not great. It's it's like um, a wet sump device that holds water permanently with your organics building up, breaking down over time. Um, I want to point out something that probably sets um, sets the scene, I guess, when you might be getting told that you know, hey, we're manufacturer X and we don't need a false floor. Well, there's a bit of a difference um, between not needing one and not being able to have one. We pour a false floor because we think it's good practice um, for design, it's safe. There's a whole lot of benefits. Supporting the pipe work, don't get misled or confused by others that might say to you, we don't need one. It's probably because of, as a consequence of the design of the filter that they can't have one. Right? So other filters on the market might be upflow, base surface area, a lot smaller surface area. Um, they need that space to be open. They can't concrete it. It's pretty simple. Cartridges need to be removed. Pipework needs to come off. Bolts need to be undone for cartridges to be removed. They can't put a false floor in. Just be mindful of that. So it, it is good in practice to have a false floor. All right, so some photos there just to show you a few examples. If it's not concrete, aluminium. Um, HDP, here's some aluminium tanks, for example. If you're in a building and you're boundary to boundary excavation, you might have a system in a plant room that you can utilize um, combination ocean garden cartridges all in one. We do this quite often for buildings in the city, uh, major cities, green star projects, for example, you might not have water quality objectives, whatever it might be. We can design special tanks to fit in tight spaces, lightweight, full access. Again, cartridges are easy to handle, put them in a building, um, no problem. We can design for that solution as well or situation. So column C green stars, not unheard of with that sort of arrangement. We do um, 
often provide advice regarding having the systems online or offline. So you do have to be mindful of that as well. I mean, think of it this way, for example, if we have a 10 cartridge storm filter, nine, um, nine litres a second, if they're 690 piece sub cartridges, what's the point of putting 300 litres a second or 500 litres, whatever the flow rate might be through the system. Low flow, we're treating um, the design flow from the music model perspective and we're bypassing the peaks of those storms. No need for, for them to be put through the system. We don't want that potential for scale. We don't have to put it through. You might have a limit on your weir size, for example. So there's a hydraulic capacity um, limitation. Offline designs, I showed you that example a few slides ago in, as a detention arrangement with a dissipation wall or a low flow arrangement in the OSD, we can do that. You can see this schematic on the right hand side. We can do an internal diversion or within the one precast unit in, in a lot of cases as well. So we eliminate the need to have a diversion pit with a weir. So we can do it internally. Again, innovation, no worries, just let us know and we'll see what we can work out. So some of the features, obviously we've spoken about, well, I've spoken about a lot of those now, we've just covered a lot of those, but predictable maintenance. Um, the cartridges come apart, as I said, so we can, we can inspect them. They're easy to inspect if they're in the tank. You take the hood off, easy to do. You're not undoing 10, 20, 30 bolts. You're taking off a cap, you take the hood off, you look at the media, scratch down. You can determine what's happening to the system. Um, if um, the cartridges come back to us, which they do often in our maintenance contracts, we're refurbing them and sending them out. Parts are replaceable, easy, cheap, simple, and the system goes out and goes, to, goes out to fight another day on another site somewhere else. Um, pretty effective and I think responsible in terms of design. We're, we're trying to improve the, the outcome here in the environment. We reuse as much as we can. In terms of maintenance, we offer general guides. We obviously have our operation and maintenance manuals for both products. Um, so the guides are there. Uh, obviously every site is different. I think it's important to, to identify what your pollutant loads are once the systems are installed. So we're often pro providing advice to asset owners to either, if you want to engage us in a, in a contract, happy to come and inspect systems and determine, provide a frequency based on what your site is actually producing. You, you're gonna probably get, you know, with Stormfilter, for example, you know, you, you're probably gonna get, say, one, two minimum years out of it, probably three years on your longer end. Um, but if you sign up, you know, in terms of maintenance contracts, which I'll, um, I'll talk about in a sec as well, you know, we're gonna replace cartridges, you know, every two to three years in a long-term contract. It's responsible and it's gonna give you a better outcome um, generally. You know the systems are working long-term, um, better, be better for the asset owners and better for your, for your requirements under you know, legislation, if it's council conditions, what, what have you. I know there are some councils out there that require cartridges to be replaced at a certain frequency. So we build that into our long-term contracts because the cartridges are reusable and they come apart, it's very cheap to maintain for us. We have multiple options. So it's either pay as you go, Call us up, you need a new set of cartridges, you need some new Ocean Guard bags, no worries, we'll send out new ones, we'll take the old ones back. Um, we can do a full complete service, provide the vacuum truck as well, dispose of the waste, provide certification as required, or we, um, we can sign up a long-term contract. You know, we have contracts, we have I think 400 plus contracts now under either our facilities management plan, long-term agreement, um, with body corporates or with um, your asset owner, you know, simple maintenance contracts. Uh, again, I, I use Blacktown as an example, five year contracts often um, are required prior to occupation. So we have contracts in place uh, because we know what our costs are, because we've done this for so long, we have true costs for these systems. We're not guessing and we're not just trying to, to limit the, um, the number of cleans that we're gonna provide just to bring costs down. We know what, it, what is required. We know what it takes to block these systems. So we, we design it responsibly. So as I said, we offer these services. Um, we're out there cleaning a lot of systems on a daily basis. We have our vacuum trucks and our, our, our teams um, on the East Coast that are cleaning systems continually, as I said, on a daily basis. So whether it's designing, uh, providing hydraulic advice, maintenance services, whether it's installation services uh, or education, a big part of what we do as Ocean Protect now is education, advocacy. You know, you might've heard of zero litre to ocean. Jump on LinkedIn, look at, look at our, um, look at our uh, what do you call it? Our Ocean Protect LinkedIn page or, or our um, um, you know, other social media platforms and you'll see what we're doing out there. So that's pretty much it guys. I, um, I thank you for your time. I apologize again about the start. Um, goes to show 
we're a bit better at water quality than we are at maybe running <laughs> or I am anyway. So thanks guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for your time. We will go to questions. I and guess. I'll, thank you so much for it. And obviously uh, first apologies for any background noise you hear uh, at my end, um, getting my bathroom renovated as we speak. So we'll see how we go. But uh, obviously if you've got further questions following on from today, Harit's contact details are there. Uh, so if you've got any uh, questions that don't get covered today, please uh, feel free to reach out to Harit. And if you do have any questions, as uh, many do already, please put them in the Q&A forum uh, and we'll try to address them um, all today. Uh, and look, I'll let Harut have a little bit of a breather before he dives into getting grilled by all the Q&A. Because uh, oh, yeah. there was a couple of questions that I know I can at least have a crack at answering. So there was a question early on from Evan uh, Bonturo around, do we have approximate numbers of how many ocean guards are installed in Sydney? Yeah, look, so... Uh, in Sydney, uh, we, we've installed around 10,000. Uh, there's about 20,000 all up across Australia, but in the Sydney metro area, there's about 10,000. Similarly for storm filter, we put in about 28,000 across Australia and about 14,000 of those are in Sydney. Uh, there was a question also, and look, as a side note, that the, 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 the amount of pollution that these devices remove is staggering. So obviously it depends on how often these devices are getting maintained. But if we assume that they are getting appropriately maintained, these devices are probably removing about seven tonne a day of pollution uh, across Australia. Um, and accumulatively, we think we've probably removed, uh, again, if, uh, if these devices have been maintained, which we don't know, um, uh, if they have been maintained, we've probably removed um, through all Ocean Protect assets around 11,000 tonnes. So 11,000 tonnes of uh, pollution are not in a, a waterway uh, because of these assets. Um, Harut, can you see the chat and Q and A uh, function? Because um, I can go yeah. through them as well if you like. Or... Yeah, no, I can see a few few questions popping up there, and and I guess yeah. Oh, sorry, as, as a side note, it's, there's ten thousand Ocean Guard style uh, baskets. Obviously, there's been uh, a previous generation device as well, uh, pre, yeah, pre Ocean exactly. Guard. Sorry, Harut. Yep. Sorry, Harut. No, no, all good. I, I just noticed, obviously, yeah, with with Evan's questions there as well. Um, you know, in terms of replacement period. Um, I mentioned there with storm filter, you know, the expectation, you know, could be anywhere from one to three years. If the systems are designed properly, you know, we're designing these in music and often, you know, we'll have a music model. We're looking at helping an engineer and it might say in music that, for example, you only need, you know, three cartridges, for example, storm filter cartridges, whatever size it might be. But we look at the mass load. We think about the mass load. We think about the application that the system's being used in. And we might come back to the engineer and say, hey, listen, you know what? You might actually need a couple more for these reasons. And yes, it might be a little bit more costly up front, but it's going to work better long term. It's going to give the asset a, a better outcome. So in answer to the question there in, in regard to replacement period, um, you know, we, we have a lot of data, I guess. And, and we do, um, you know, through our R&D program, we do have that information. In fact, I think... Um, and Brad, you probably have to correct me, but with the Filterra paper, for example, that we have, that we've, um, that we've got out um, available now, um, it might represent the amount of pollutant loads that we might have coming off WSU. We've got other studies mm. in any case that do have that level of information in there. So, you know, we can provide that, Evan, that information to you. If there are systems, you know, that um, you're looking at and you want to know life cycle costs, just let us know and we'll, we'll work it out for you. It's not um, uncommon that we're running net present value calculations for 20, 30 years. I know Walling de for example, in some cases, they require a 30 year estimate, which we've done. Um, so, you know, whether it's our storm footer systems, jellyfish systems in their LGA, or whether it's Filterra, we've done that for them. Mm. There's been a few questions actually uh, along these, this line of ha what happens uh, to the used filter media? Uh, after the, the cartridges have been replaced. So how do, and how, obviously how do we d dispose of the attached pollution uh, attached to that filter media? So what happens? Right. Yep, so look, I guess with the, with the pollution we, we remove from these systems, um, a lot of the pollution will tend to go to, um, you know, a couple of locations. We know there's a, there's a few um, waste facilities that actually recycle a lot of the material. Um, so there's a couple we're talking to at the moment in Sydney. Uh, I know um, for sure a lot of that material goes to um, a couple of locations and I believe up to 90% of um, your plastic waste, for example, is recycled. The media itself from the cartridges, um, that's work in progress. We're actually working on, on that at the moment because we're developing a bit of a sustainability plan. So the problem with the media, especially the perlite and the fossil media, um, or in the old cartridges, the ZPG with the, the Z-Lite, 
you've, you've got chemical reactions taking place. You're actually exhausting material. What can you do with it? Um, you know, not too much with perlite. You're actually physically um, blocking the pores with, you know, sediment load, TSS load, organics. So it's the processes yet aren't yet advanced enough for us to do something with that to get it back to a state where we can use it again. So unfortunately, a lot of that material will go to specialty trade waste um, or landfill. But other pollutants that come out of the system are recycled and, and reused. Cool. A very early question, which I can address her, her it was one from Ainsley. How do you claim 100% gross pollutant capture on the Ocean Guard when it has an overflow bypass? Um, very simple answer is uh, it's 100% GP capture up to the high flow bypass rate. So yeah, you'd probably get on a 90, 95% removal as you've indicated. Um, so that's just a simple music trick. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of questions around the, uh, again, the, I'm just scrolling through them. The same question that you've uh, just uh, addressed. Um, a question from Laith Al Moyle. Uh, Harut, if the lower part of the filter is clogged, does that not result in standing water? I.e. the first 100 millimetres becomes clogged, then you have 100 millimetres of standing water. Yep. So, um, well, look, well, the best answer to that is, is what we find in the field. Um, so when we go and look at these systems, no, you don't have that, that you know, 100 mils of standing water in the storm footer system, unless I guess if the system's been in there for 10 years and we haven't had an opportunity to clean it, if the asset owner hasn't given us the chance to go in there. Um, we obviously try and, and maintain as many systems as we can, but the systems I've looked at, the systems that our, our crews go out to, um, you know, it's, I, I don't recall seeing that much. And to be honest, you've got to remember also that you're building up sediment load in that chamber as well. So that, that area, um, you know, obviously the cartridge is back flush, so they tend to actually move a lot of that material away, but you're accumulating material in that area. So even if that bottom, say 100 mil, is not part of the area under the hood where the agitation occurs with that back flush mechanism, you're still giving it a bit of a chance to clear because the water's got to come back down through that pathway anyway via the cartridge. But in simple um, terms, as I said, Lath, uh, we're going out to a lot of these sites and, you know, happy to, happy to go out with you guys from council as well. If you want to go and inspect a few systems, we did an audit. Um, it was about two years ago now um, for Blacktown Council. Um, the data's all there and we've got lots of photos. Happy to go out and have a look at a bunch more systems as well. I'm doing it with a few other councils. So yeah, let's go have a look. But you, I, I don't tend to find you have that much standing water, to be honest, if any, in these systems. Well, there's a question from Glenn around, around false floors. Has there, been any, any, has there been any discussion about moving away from concrete false floors for the storm filters? Um, look, we, we tend to use concrete um, typically, but we do have examples or, or situations where we, we don't use concrete. We still employ a barrier, so there is a false floor. We, we don't want a, either an unsafe area for maintenance workers we don't want to have that standing water, I guess, um, you know, exposed. We want organics to be separated from, from that if we can. So in some cases, we've used aluminium um, sumps or aluminium decks uh, and, um, you know, similar, similar type systems to that. Um, we've got some large systems, whether it's in uh, all parts of Sydney. I, I think we've done it in Queensland as well. It'd be no different to that aluminium tank, for example, that I showed there. The floor is actually an aluminium floor. In some of the storm footer manholes in the bigger systems, we actually employ an aluminium sump across a portion of the tank. So it's an aluminium floor anyway. So now we don't have to do it in concrete, um, but you know, it just depends on the size of the system and how practical it is. It's a lot simple. It's obviously sturdy. It's gonna support the pipe work, you know, um, and, and it lasts. Obviously you've got design life you've got to think about as well. And Ainsley, has a, Ainsley Kirk has a question that I certainly had uh, before I joined because it's hard to understand. How, she's trying to understand the hydraulics of the filters. Uh, so at what point is the float valve activated and what point does it close it again? Okay, so um, with if I go back to that example I think I gave with the 690 um, cartridge, the 690 cartridge. So from the top of the false floor as water starts building up, that float's going to sit... Um, in its original position um, until water gets 690 high, technically 690 millimetres high. So essentially to the top of the actual cartridge, to the shoulder of the cartridge is close enough, essentially. That's, that's where the air valve is. That's where the top of the float's going to lift. So at that point, those floats are designed to actually pop, to lift up, open up the float, uh, the restricted disc, sorry, at the bottom of the cartridge and allow for that siphon to be engaged. Until water gets to the bottom of that uh, or close about an inch from the bottom of the hood, 
we've got what we call um, these um, scrubbers. So they're, they're in little slots around the cartridge in specifically designed locations. As I said, there's eight iterations of the design on the storm footer cartridge. This was one of the, the, the things that was looked at in detail. When the water gets to that point where there's the little slots, that's what creates the agitation, allows those air bubbles to, to be formed and clear the surface of that cartridge. So you get down to about 100 mils, as Lath has pointed out there in his question, towards the false floor. And that remaining water will now simply drain out slowly over time. It actually takes a bit longer to pass through the cartridge. The floaters reset. It's got a slight imperfect seal on the bottom of it. So water can just slowly seep out. And that's how that standing water, or let's call it standing water, that remaining water will actually now drain out. A uh, question okay. from Bryce. Uh, one question is roughly how long does it take to actually clean out uh, the treatment system? Obviously, it depends on the size of the system, but have you got, can you give us some rough numbers, Haroon? Um, yeah, I, I guess it, it would depend, obviously, on, look, access. Um, what, what can we take to the site? You know, if it's, if it's a system in the back corner of a resi uh, or residential complex, um, you can't get a vehicle to it. So, um, so you, you've got to do it by hand. And again, because we don't hold water and because the systems are lightweight, we can do it all by hand. So if it's in the back corner, it, you're draining through an easement through the rear of the property, you know, you might take a bit longer. If it's at the front and you can get your ute or the vacuum truck to the site, you might have a lot more cartridges. Um, you know, I, I'd be guessing if I threw a number out there, but I mean, I've, some of the examples I've looked at, and I'll throw a big, big example out to you. I know we, we've got a 200 cartridge system out at Penrith that we clean for Penrith Council periodically. Um, from memory, that's about a, a, a two-day exercise. You know, 200 cartridges, vacuuming, cartridge replacement. Um, you know, so your smaller typical systems, you know, we'll do either within a few hours or, you know, definitely within the day. Um, so that's usually not an issue. Just on the baskets, you can clean them by hand or you can clean them with a vacuum um, as well, if you like. So that's just to, to clarify there. Obviously, quick and simple, lift the grate, lift the bag, empty it, put it back in. The bag has a supporting ring around the top, so it sits, seats back into the frame quite simply. Close the grate, you're done. Cool. Uh, I might give you a bit of a breath and try and answer some of these questions, Harut. Um, so there's a question from Che McKenzie around, can you talk through the uh, CSTR detention tank modelling assumptions? Do these values reduce the pollutant load in addition to the filters? So... This is something I've seen uh, very inconsistently applied across our industry. And it's something that we're trying to change essentially. So uh, as Harut indicated before, we really recommend uh, when we're modeling the storm filter or any sort of filter in a tank, you've got your generic node, which models the, the performance of the, the, the system you know, how much pollution it removes, et cetera. And obviously you have a detention tank node or any other sort of detention type node uh, that uh, essentially acts as the hydraulic control, you know, volume, area, et cetera. But really you shouldn't uh, essentially double dip the performance uh, by assuming that you're getting some removal associated with that detention tank node. So as Haru indicated, Ocean Protect recommend uh, essentially changing the K value to uh, in that detention tank node to one or zero. So essentially it means you don't get any treatment out of that uh, detention tank node in music. All the treatments in the generic node uh, and, th and those performances are based on monitoring, et cetera. But what we see in our industry is some, of, some uh, manufacturers um, essentially don't do that. They, they essentially claim treatment where none physically exists in that detention tank node. And we generally see them do that when they know they can get away with it. Let's face it. I'm sorry if I'm upsetting people. I know uh, Michael Wicks, our director, will be listening and saying, don't, don't say anything that I'm going to get sued for. But the reality is uh, we see very inconsistent standards across the industry. The Healthy Land and Water Guidelines have sort of provided some advice in their consultation draft around this issue. And we'd like, seem to like to see that acro applied across the industry. It's a really simple cheat that we see our industry do. Now, I can talk to them blue, blue in the face around um, the scientific rationale behind this, but the reality is it's dodgy modelling when people essentially assume the default values for detention tanks when they're, when they're modelling filter-type devices. Do, do, am I going to get sued, Harut? No, good answer. Good on you. No, it's okay. all right. Look, it's, all, it's all about transparency and being honest, I guess, it's <laughs> yeah. all, and providing details that's, that, that has meaning. I might just run through a few quick questions here as well. Mm. Um, so Rob Eltabaji, has the flow rate through the new cartridge been evaluated and determined? Does, um, does 
the height affect this? Well, look, the cartridge vessel itself, so the 694, 6310, they're all the same. We've obviously with the PSORB um, media, we've controlled it with the, with the restricted disc. That's how we control the flow rate and the contact time on the media. Um, so yes, that's, that's why the flow rates are different for PSORB versus NPG, and that's what we've determined through the testing. And therefore the performance is relatable to that. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Scott McMillan, how do ocean guards remove nitrogen and phosphorus? Um, look, with your, with your basket type devices, look, it's a dry sump system. It's not like your gross pollutant traps that hold water permanently. Um, so you limit your, obviously your, your nutrient capture. So an ocean guard holds the pollutants dry, limiting the organic breakdown. So you're talking about particulate or larger matter, obviously. Um, I noticed a question here from Ainsley Kirk, is the piece of storm for allowable in Blacktown Council? Short answer, no. Not yet. ZPG still approved there, still quite effective um, and cost effective, I guess, in terms of design. But watch this space. Um, you know, we'll have news to release soon about a, a bunch of products. We have new technologies um, that we're working on. Some new technologies we have released to the market. Um, you know, Ocean Safe, for example, our G new GPT based on continuous deflective separation approved in Blacktown for private and public. Um, you'll, you'll see a few things. Watch this space, piece or um, you know, we'll, we'll get there soon, hopefully. So, and just before um, you go further, Haru, I'm, I'm conscious of time. We've nearly hit the hour mark. So you've done very well to get through a heap of content uh, in this so. amount of time. We actually will, for everyone who's still with us, um, we'll actually uh, have this recording available online as well. So if you need to get back to work, that's cool. Uh, but we're actually still getting quite a few questions coming in. So yeah. look, we won't take it personally if you leave us. Uh, you're welcome to contact Haru separate to this, but just, in the, uh, just to sort of help out the people that have asked questions, uh, we will actually get to all of your questions so we'll call it an extended q a session how about that so um Ruth, do you want to take up take the next one uh yeah look uh i noticed matthew butterelli some councils in sydney are now not accepting storm footers or um similar devices due to ability uh limited ability to remove dissolved nutrients um these councils are now requiring vegetative treatment solutions so in short um the answer to your question matthew do we have something to um uh, to put into that sport to supply as a solution. Yes, Filterra is the solution. We have a vegetated high flow bioretention system called Filterra that we design as either an in situ basin type arrangement or precast pits. Funny you should mention that because um, we've recently been working with uh, Northern Beaches Council, so I'm not sure if that's where this has come up. Um, Ruby Ardren's been wonderful and we provided a, um, some information to her and therefore our Filterra tree pits um, are acceptable for use in place of cartridges in parts of Northern Beaches, um, LGA. We're going to provide it with a lot more information um, and any other councils that are interested, by all means, let us know. Um, so we have a compact um, solution that's good for that residential type application or any other application where you're trying to look at bioretention, but you might be limited for space. Filtera ticks that box. In terms of um, can we change perception on how our filters work? Absolutely. Always working in that space. We have, um, as I said, data available. We're, we're, we're out in the field doing monitoring and testing continuously so we can continue to provide confidence or answer questions that, that councils may have. So yes, we, we do have information and there's more coming. Um, Ainsley Kirk, further to my question, the water that seeps out the cartridge after the float is shut, um, does that go through the filter meter? Absolutely, Ainsley. Sorry, I, didn't, I probably wasn't um, detailed enough. So as the float drops back down, that portion of water that's sitting in the cartridge um, chamber around the cartridges will slowly seep through the media through under the, the float has a slight imperfect seal so it allows that water to slowly seep out so it may take a bit longer it actually takes longer for the water to get through that base of the, of the cartridge you're actually getting better performance um, so yes it will go through the media and no it won't be untreated it'll be treated um Jay mckenzie what are your thoughts on stormwater detention modeling with these filters does having water ponding up behind the weir before the filter activates reduce the volume of the tank for detention? So good question, Che. And I think that's probably, when I, when I was running through some of the differences um, and I mentioned that regardless um, of the system, or right, as I've mentioned there, that, that water that's in the, the base of the system, it will always drain through our system. Yes, there are some products on the market that will not drain until the siphon is fully engaged. Um, so you could potentially have lost volume in your OSD tank if you're accounting for that volume in the storm filter chamber. So in our opinion for our system for storm filter, yes, the chamber does provide OSD volume. It does um, um, contribute to your attenuation calculations. Yes. 
just realised we missed a question uh, from Leith Almoyle. Is if if the false if the false floor is reduced to fifty millimetres, how do you ensure the flows remain? Do you use low profile RHS type drainage? Yep. So I, I assume Leith probably. Um, what you're referring to there is because the false floor has been reduced, obviously our pipe work has to reduce in size in some way. So we have a matrix um, that we use internally to determine how many pipes we would need, whether it's like you've mentioned RHS for shallow profile, which we do use. It might be 80 mil, 50 mil PVC pressure pipe. We have um, flume, which is a 150 by 100 section. So depending on the false floor thickness, um, we will, uh, appropriately size the under drains and we know how many filters we can apply to each length of pipe depending on the pipe that we use. So for RHS, if we reduce to 50 mil, yes, we would um, we will see limit how many cartridges we can connect to it, but that's how we'd get, we'd get to the 50 mil. Um, the alternative to using pipe and RHS would be to actually have a full aluminium sump that we can re reduce to a 50 mil false floor um, opening underneath. So the entire volume underneath is open and we have the connectors in the actual aluminium sump multiple ways of doing it, um, but that's how you would do it. So the, the flows still operate, the system works as it normally would. So I'm not sure Very if I missed good. I think I think we've actually covered all the questions. Uh, people are welcome to put in a, one final doozy if they want to, uh, Stump Harut. Um, but look, um, thanks for everyone who came along today. We had a few technical dramas at the start, but uh, we managed to recover and uh, amazingly well. Uh, so we had a lot of interest in this webinar. Over, I think, 110, 120 people dialed in to hear Harut talk about storm filter nation guys so thank you so much for everyone who has attended and is still hanging on um i think there's 74 people still uh, listening in uh if you're interested in in, a, in this uh, and other webinars we've obviously uh recorded um some previously including uh one on the filtera bioretention system which harit alluded to there's a stack of information in that webinar uh and that's uh all available uh the youtube links the documents etc all available on our Ocean Protect website under ed, under education and webinars. So there was a Filtera Bio webinar. There was one on SquidEp as well. So all the information is available on our website. We also got a couple of upcoming ones. So one in early December on the uh, design and management of gross pollutant traps uh, by Daniel Page and Peter Worth. Uh, also, just a shout out to Storm of Queensland, Storm of New South Wales, have a joint webinar in mid-November on the uh, appropriate uh, enforcement of maintenance requirements for, on private sites. And that's uh, a presentation by Blacktown City Council's Ben Penelaric and Andrew Thomas as well, which is right up uh, the uh, alley of what uh, Harit was talking about because there's they, these assets are great but they're useless if they don't get appropriately maintained and certainly Blacktown City Council is leading the way in, 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 in terms of appropriately ensuring the maintenance of these assets on private sites in particular so looking forward to that but without further ado thank you guys so much for your time today uh, if you've got further questions uh, for Harut um, please reach out via his contact details there but uh, again, thanks for everyone who uh, attended and asked uh, hard hitting questions to Harut. Big shout out to Harut for uh, the webinar today. Great presentation. And I uh, hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks very much, guys. See you guys. Be good.